Sports have a way of bringing us all together. And at Sleeper, we developed a fantasy platform designed to make leagues more fun and personal. Sleeper includes an integrated chat and every feature you could want for your NFL, NBA, and even eSport leagues. Plus, it's completely free with no ads. See why millions have made Sleeper the fastest-growing fantasy platform. Download Sleeper on the App Store or Google Play today. We can sum up McDonald's new crispy chicken sandwich in one word. Crispy. But also juicy and tender. Maybe crispy, juicy, tender. All one word? Okay, fine. You'll just have to try our crispy chicken sandwich to understand it. Get a free medium fries and medium soft drink with purchase of any crispy chicken sandwich. Available only on the app. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Price of participation may vary. McDonald's app download and registration required. And I think adventure is, is that. Big, big challenges. You don't necessarily have to go to Africa, but really challenging yourself for the first time in a big way. It can be really empowering. And it, that was what changed my life. And that's kind of almost what set a theme <laughs> for what I do. Hey folks, Mason here. Welcome to the show. Um, Before we get started, I did want to share a very random story from this weekend that was uh, actually really cool. Um, If you remember back in episode 612, we had a family of six on the show to talk about through hiking the Pacific Crest Trail together. And just so happened, you know, we were talking and we realized we're all from the same area in Central Florida. We had no idea when we first started talking. And, And, you know, fast forward a couple years and my good friend, recently moved to a new neighborhood uh, in in this town in Central Florida. And he's like, hey, man, you're not going to believe this, but just a couple doors down from me is that family of six that you talk to. And he's like, y'all have to meet. So we, we planned this big uh, weekend get-together thing with, uh, with, with their family and a couple other families. And he went ahead and invited them over. And they came over, uh, and we just got to talk. It was so cool meeting a, you know, a, a former guest of the show, honestly. Not only one guest, but six guests of the show, all kind of all at once. And since we had last talked... That family has also through hiked the Continental Divide Trail and the Appalachian Trail, which they just finished like two months ago. So they had tons of stories to tell, and we will absolutely have them back on the show. But, you know, it isn't often that I get to meet actual guests of the show because, you know, y'all come from everywhere. Today's that guest, Belinda, is actually in the UK. There's a good chance we might not ever run into each other. But I tell you what, you interview enough people from around the world, eventually you're going to run into somebody. And this past weekend was one of those instances. And it was it was just really cool. And also, how cool is it, a whole family of six, to do literally 8,000 miles of through hiking together? Um, gosh, talk about family goals. And it's actually a great segue into today's episode. Belinda... Um, who's today's guest, talks uh, so much about The Adventure Revolution, which is also the name of her new book, The Adventure Revolution, uh, which is all about why adventure is essential to a a healthy lifestyle, a a healthy mental state, and not a luxury. You know, it's easy to think that these adventures we go on, these things we plan for, are just a luxury. And and, and honestly, they they can be. They definitely are. Um, We're definitely fortunate to be able to do these kinds of things. Uh, but it's more than that. It's essential to to our well-being in a lot of ways, and there's a ton of science that backs that up. So um, Belinda's on the show today to talk about a lot of that, talk about how she got into uh, got into adventure and honestly has had a career centered around adventure and adventure filmmaking. She's worked with Bear Grylls. She's worked with David Attenborough um, and on tons of different types of projects. So I'm really excited to get into her story. But before we jump in, I did want to shout out our new sponsor, Green Chef. If you don't know, my wife and I recently had a baby, literally like four weeks ago, and there has not been a ton of time to cook or to meet. Meal prep is the big one. I'm planning out the meals and grocery shopping and all that. And Green Chef was gracious enough to send us some meals to kind of get through that time. They sent us a bunch of different kinds, like 10 different meals. Um, And we were able to try all these different things. And if you know me, I'm a stickler for portions. Um, And so I was a little hesitant. I've never tried a meal planning or meal prep kit where they send you all the ingredients and everything in a box in the mail right to your front door. And all you got to do is kind of follow the the easy to follow instructions and, and cook it all. 
But I'll be honest, it was a cool experience. There's, there's, you really do cook the meals. They just have it all there for you. And it's stuff that I would never would have thought of or never would have planned myself, but was totally capable of doing myself. But Green Chef just made it incredibly easy. We, you know, especially with the newborn, with some of the challenges that we're facing right at the very beginning, it was just easy to say, hey, this is going to be a healthy, nutritious, immune boosting meal all balanced diet, you know, all, it's all healthy, but it's all really filling. And like I said, I'm a stickler for portions. So I was a little bit skeptical that I, it would feed me. Um, but dang, every time we made a meal, there was some left over for, for, for lunch the next day, I was a little bit blown away. So if you think you'd like to give it a shot, if you think your life is in a, in a spot where meal kits make sense, um, go to greenchef.com slash ASP 100 and use the code ASP 100 at checkout to get $100 off, including free shipping. Again, that's greenchef.com slash ASP100 and use the discount 100 to get $100 off and free shipping. All right, let's get into Belinda's story. Linda Kirk, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hello. Um, I'm great to, great to be here. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah. I, I know you mentioned it already, but for the listeners, can you uh, can you tell us where you're coming from today and, and where's home for you? Yeah, we're, we're really lucky. We live in a remote corner of Exmoor National Park, which is one of the, uh, Britain's national parks down in the south, down the south of England. Uh, and it's, it's nice and... Uh, for England, it's nice and remote anyway. Not as remote as some of the parts of America. You've, you've got a bit more space there. But it's it's pretty lovely and remote. So uh, um, we're, we're pretty bad for internet often, but hopefully just enough to talk to you today. Oh, yeah, that, that's all you need. You know, being bad on internet ain't a bad thing most of the time. Um, I wish I could. I wish I had that excuse a little bit more, honestly. <laughs> um, it's like, oh, can't do anything. I, we don't have internet, but... Uh, well, d- describe it a little bit. What is it like? Because I know, I know the picture of the UK. I've been in the UK a few times, but what is what is it like near that national park? I've never been. Okay. Well, the other just while we're on connectedness, the great thing about our house is there's no mobile signal, so <laughs> that's already a good thing. Um, it's um, it's very green. Um, I know people. I know. Uh, people always think Britain has a lot of rain we don't we don't actually have as much rain as all that but it is very green Um, and Exmoor particularly is lovely lots of really deep wooded river valleys which have got a real wilderness feeling Um, obviously England's a a bit smaller than America we we struggle for for the feeling of wilderness I think over here you have to go up to Scotland to have a really good feeling of wilderness here but um but Exmoor is a very good close second to getting up to Scotland. Um, and it's a whole lot better connected because you can get to the cities and stuff a bit easier. But it's, it's yeah, lots of wooded valleys and um, lots of moorland. When we sit at our kitchen table, you can see um, uh, we see barn owls and, and sparrow hawks and stuff, which is really, really, it's really, really lucky, actually. My partner's a paints birds for a living um so he's a we call him a twitcher i don't know if you have that word in um in america but yeah he knows all the birds so um we we're doing a lot to rewild our land here and bring as much um wildlife in um yeah exmoor is a lovely little place it's it's also the least visited national park in britain which is one of the things we love about it so don't do don't go telling too many people <laughs> <laughs> But tell us about real quick. I know you've talked about your childhood on other podcasts, and you mentioned you know you were you were almost a feral child. W- was that something you had the awareness of as a kid, like that you had some freedom, um, or was it something you look back on and think, "Wow, that was that was pretty unique." Oh, I, I don't think at the time I had I had anything to compare it to. I, I think whatever you have as a child is just normal at the time, isn't it? Whether you have the craziest upbringing or not. I think also back when I was a kid, which was a little while ago now, um, it was a bit more normal back then to have more freedom. I think children have less freedom now, We're, especially in England. I mean, it's, it's less, I, I can't say I'm, you know, I'm so sure about in, in America. I think in cities, though, for example, 
it's much harder to let your kids roam free, isn't it? And um, and so I was really lucky. I grew up on a, a small, there's a small set of islands between Britain, between England and France. So there's a, there's, um, a bit of water in between and there's a small, there's some small islands. And I grew up on one of them called Alderney. And growing up on a small island, everyone knows everyone. Um, there's very few. There were very few cars, really, or at least not busy roads. You know, not busy big roads. So, I think the two two worries that we that parents have, especially nowadays, about you know traffic and stranger danger, as we call it in Britain, you just we just I, we didn't have that. So I had this real freedom, and I'd just go off all day, build dens, climb trees, find secret, you know, secret gardens and. Just have just have uh, a lot of freedom, which I now just so I'm so glad that I had that. And now that I've got my own son as well, we part. Well, probably the main reason that we finally moved to Exmoor because we were talking about moving here for years was because we were going to have a you know we were going to have a son when I, we moved here when I was pregnant, and so we finally moved because we wanted to give him that same sort of um, start. Having an adventurous start in life really sets you up well for life, I think. I mean, I, I completely agree, and uh, I'm sure uh, y'all are doing a great job out there having your son also live a, a feral childhood. I know we we try to do that as much as we can, allow some freedom. I, I'm trying to be the parent, like, hey, if I if I was to approach what I the things I approached my parents with as a parent, will I be able to handle if my sons approach me with those same ideas? I need to be ready with answers and ready to say yes to those things. Um, maybe a little more willing than my parents were with me. And so um, that's something I'm definitely always thinking about too. Uh, but, but for you, uh, you know, when you, when you got out, would you say you came from an adventurous pa- uh, family? Were your parents adventurous? Um, and, and was that encouraged or did you have to really fight for it? I was lucky. I had, I had definitely had influences. So my main influence was my grandfather. He was a zoology professor in Africa. So I grew up with tales of, of Africa, basically. Um, I, I was born in England and raised in England. When I was very young, I think about three or four, I went over to Africa for the first time, or maybe a bit younger than that, actually. But yeah, I went to Africa a few times when I was very young. And also my mother was brought up in Africa. So there was lots of tales of, you know, having a, um, having African adventures, um, my, because my grandfather was a zoology professor, he, he was involved with a lot of animal, um, saving lots of animals that were brought to him. Like, for example, they had a pet elephant in the house, which sounds ridiculous. But um, sadly, when the, the mother of an elephant is, is, was shot, um, that, that elephant won't survive. So because it was so young, they brought it to my granddad and they said, you know, can you can you look after it? And um, they had it for several years until he got too big. So there was these kind of crazy stories of, or there was these stories of, I don't know, I, I suppose adventure, but definitely of, of, um, of different ways of living. You know, there was, I had broader horizons than just Britain. So I think for me first, it was all about travel. And definitely my inspiration wasn't an adventure at the start. It was all about going to Africa to see what Africa was about. How did that feel? Was it? Would you say that's your first big adventure? Maybe the most impactful in the sense of of setting you on the course that your life would take. So when I was eighteen, I did finally go to Africa, and um, inspired obviously by these stories from my grandpa, my grandparents, and my and my mother. And yes, it was definitely a huge turning point in my life. I've, when I've analysed it recently, because obviously I've written this book recently and I've been analysing it a lot more and thinking about it, I thought, well, actually, that feral childhood gave me a a base that I was always going to come back to. I think if you give young children some adventure, they'll always come back to it. And then when I was um, I, when I was a teenager, we moved out of we moved away from the wilderness, really moved to a city. And I lost adventure and I lost the outdoors and, you know, um, that wonderful freedom, freedom of being outdoors and, and having adventures as a kid. So I lost it in my teenage years. 
But I came back to it when I was about 16 through a, a scheme called the Duke of Edinburgh Award, which is um, a, a, a sort of programme for adventure and, and also service that is run here in Britain. And I think it's actually run in other countries. Well, it is run in other countries as well. I don't know, maybe you have it in America. I know they definitely have it in Australia and New Zealand. But it's this wonderful opportunity that it gave me a chance to go back into the mountains and into the outdoors. And I kind of refound adventure. And it opened a little door in my head and went, wait a minute, I love this. I need this. So when I was 18, it gave me the confidence to then go to Africa. And I I don't really know how the, in a way, I would love to have kept a better diary back then. (laughs) Why did an 18 year old who had barely traveled and only sort of been on a couple of family holidays in Europe suddenly go to Africa on my own? I mean, it was terrifying, but also liberating at the same time. I worked um, with a biological um, research organization out there um, on the sort of biological field expedition, and it just was amazing. I mean, it just it changed everything about what I thought I could do. It changed everything I thought about the world. I don't know. I could go on and on about it forever, for ages. The main thing for me was that when I came back from Africa that year, I had gone out quite a shy and definitely very underconfident teenager. But I came back with this real sense of what was possible and also what I was capable of. Um, I had never really believed that I could do something like that. And yet I survived it. And so I came back with this, you know, if I can do that, then I can, I could do lots of other things that I've jumped of. You know, if, if I can go to Africa on my own, join this expedition, and then afterwards I traveled around on my own. Um, if I can do that, then I can, I can do all sorts of other things with my life. So it was a huge turning point. And I think adventure is, is that big, big challenges. You don't necessarily have to go to Africa, but really challenging yourself for the first time in a big way, especially at that age, that teenage years, you just, it can be really empowering. And it, that was what changed my life. And that's kind of almost what set a theme for, for what I do. I've, I've always been, ever since then, I've been obsessed with adventure. Um, and I think initially it was all about getting my next hit. I love that getting my next hit. That's because that's what they feel like. They feel like a, yeah, and hit. You you mentioned hit like a like a like a drug or something. I, I believe, but it's almost like a hit of of a of an artist too, like a hit song. You feel like it's something that just elevates you, and and you work towards that next one. Um. Anyway, sorry, I cut you off. No, no, but it is it is exactly like that. There's a part of there's a part of my book which is about um why it makes us feel so alive. When I interviewed lots of people for my book and um, what I and also through through just taking people on adventures for 25 years, I I would often use the phrase that I feel most alive when I'm on adventures. But also when I interviewed all these people to try and figure out, I was like, I really need to figure out why adventure changes lives so positively. And yet we don't seem to value it. We don't seem to, you know, the adventure's not branded well <laughs> like it's really essential and yet we think it's quite frivolous it's kind of a luxury but it isn't it's really essential so I was, I was really thinking about how why do we feel why does it make us feel so alive and one thing I noticed when I interviewed all these different people was that they all kept coming out with this phrase it makes me feel alive or it makes me feel so alive or it makes me feel more alive than anything else and I think it's it is you know that hit that you get from adventure is that empowering empowerment it's that um it's also potentially uh, depends what you're doing but it, it can also be flow state i don't know if you know about flow state but that idea in, in mm-hmm. positive psychology it's that idea that when you're doing something that you've trained for and you're doing it really well and you're so incredibly immersed in that moment that everything else disappears and you're just incredibly happy i mean happy is a kind of um, not the right word. It's not accurate enough. But you can become so immersed and engaged in the moment that you you are in something called flow state, which is this wonderful phrase that positive psychologists have come up with that really explains some of those highs that you can reach. So there's all these different ways you can really achieve you know, these highs. Achievement, flow state, 
um, empowerment. So yeah, it is. Adventure does give you a hit completely. It, it, there's nothing like it. I can't seem to replicate it in other aspects of life the same way. You know, there's still wonderful, wonderfully rewarding parts of life, but something about adventure, like nothing else seems to be able to fill that void. You know what I'm saying? And like it can't, it, and that can't fill the void for other things either. Um, but you're right. It, it isn't, it isn't branded well. It isn't marketable. Well. I haven't heard it put that way, but that's, that's really what it feels like. It does feel like a luxury when we, you know, talk about it, but, but it is a need. It absolutely is a need. What do you do as someone as experienced as you are? And this is definitely jumping ahead. Someone as experienced with adventure you are, what do you do to continue getting that hit or getting that feeling? Does it wear off over time? And, And do you have to find new ways to get that feeling back? That's a, that's a really good question. I think two things that come to mind before I forget. (laughs) Um, um, Firstly, I think you you take other people on adventures and that is where you get a whole other level of joy. Um, And you'll have seen that with your, your son or with, with friends that you've taken on adventures. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. The other thing is I think for me, a, or for my understanding of adventure and what I think about when I think of adventure is that it's all about leaving your comfort zone. So particularly in my early part of my career I spent a lot of time in jungles and deserts um, and I became kind of um, comfortable and familiar and you know in I was kind of felt like I was in control when I was in jungles particularly because I knew what I was doing and I'd done it a lot of times so I wasn't really out of my comfort zone anymore Um, so after years of sort of it, it it seems like I was being super adventurous but actually if you even if you're in these adventurous looking places or sounding remote places, if you're doing the same things all the time, you're not really stretching yourself. You're not really learning anything else. Um, and you're not really leaving that comfort zone. So for me, something, something that really clar- clarified that for me and crystallized it in my head was um, 10 years ago, I decided to do uh, an ocean row. And I would basically never really been in the ocean very much I I actually worked as a diver for a few years but that was all kind of coastal um being out on the sea an ocean open ocean for for weeks on end wasn't something I'd experienced but the reason that I wanted to do it was because I wanted to learn something new I wanted to experience something new I wanted to get out of my comfort zone again so even after having done you know I think by that point, I was like, you know, I don't know, um, 15 years or so of doing expeditions and adventures. I'd never really done anything out in the sea. So I wanted, so I I found a new way of getting that hit, of getting that, that um, leaving my comfort zone, pushing myself, finding out what I was capable of. Um, You know, and there's great, there's great um, adversity at times, (laughs) but there's also great joy in stretching yourself and finding out what's possible. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. There are so many reasons not to skip breakfast. So many savory, mouthwatering, tasty, delicious beyond all belief reasons. Actually, that last one was pretty convincing. Stop by for a McDonald's breakfast. Mix and match a sausage biscuit, sausage McMuffin, sausage burrito, or hash browns. Any two for just two bucks. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with combo meal. Okay, so if you don't already know, Kohl's is the best kept secret for back to school shopping. My daughter's heading off to college and I got a great deal on a bedding set for her dorm, which she absolutely loves. Picked up some pillows for $11.99 and got her new jeans for just $21.99. I mean, whoa, with prices like that, you can't say no. Did I mention I got Kohl's cash and it was ready for pickup in less than an hour? So yeah, I'd say it was a success. Select styles, prices good 818 to 822, 2021. Some exclusions apply. See store or kohls.com for details. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. There, there's always a new medium to have an adventure, adventure through. You know, there's always either colder environments, hotter environments. Like you said, water literally changing the surface that you're having the adventure on. The sport, you know, adventure sports, there's 
flying sports and cycling sports, running, climbing. It's it's there's a lot of ways to experience the same place in an entirely different way, and I don't think you're going to run out of of the, the ways to do that if you have the adventure mindset. So 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 after you started experiencing your first adventure, your your trip to Africa, uh, what did you start getting into then? Was it was it just immediately I've I've got to do more like this, or was it okay? It's time to go back and get a quote real job. Uh, and then you just had the pull of adventure co- coming back for you. What what was your mindset then after Africa, and what were you doing? I think I think Africa gave me um, the confidence to think that I could go after things that I had sort of secretly hankered for. I I remember when I spoke to my we have careers advisors at school. I don't know if you have that in schools in America. Probably something like that. Yeah, kinda, I went to my. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I went to my careers advisor and um, I said, you know, she said, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up, as it were? And I said, oh, I want to be an explorer. And she she basically said I wouldn't ever do that and put me right off the idea. Oh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I always remember that conversation because I was really excited and then I came out really flat. And then so what I settled on was actually I wanted to work in adventure filmmaking and, and natural history filmmaking. And if I couldn't be an explorer, I would work with David Attenborough and I would save the world and save the whale. And that's what I wanted to do. So that's when I was 16. That was like, that is what I'm doing. I think it was I mean, it was partly because um, of my 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 grandfather was a zoologist and I had he had I'd been I had this wonderful introduction to the natural world. So I love seeing animals in the wild. And um, there's there's a real affinity with that. Also, I wanted to do something meaningful, and obviously I could do that. Yeah, and obviously to work with someone like David Attenborough, he's a complete hero. So yeah, so I went after that. And so when I came back from Africa, I thought, actually, I actually am going to try to do that. And so it gave me the confidence to attempt knocking on doors and just going for it, really. I even talked about it, possibly. I can't remember, but I never really thought I was going to be able to do it. And so what I did when I came back from Africa is I set myself up with a plan. And I thought, right, I need to do a biology degree. I need to do a film degree, you know, some sort of film um, degree. I I did a film master's in the end. And I'm going to go and I'm going to make this happen. And I was quite single minded after that. Um, so So I got into television, making adventure and natural history films. But what I kept doing on the side was I just, I kept being invited to help out on these expeditions because I started to build up some experience in the expedition world. And because I loved expeditions so much, I just kept trying to fit them into my spare time, as it were. And because I was freelance, I was living at home a lot. Um, I didn't have hardly any money, but I could, but every penny that I made was to either to, was to go on expeditions. Um, and ev- or, or to allow myself to do more work experience to get into TV, uh, sort of adventure TV. I built this kind of dual career. Uh, I never had any, hardly had any cash, but always seemed to just get through. Um, I remember eating um, rice and vegetables, <laughs> rice and beans and stuff for months at one point. Not, not a bad diet. I mean, you know, as far as from a health <laughs> perspective, not terrible, you know, not terrible and cheap. Well, cheap and actually pretty healthy. I, I, uh, I should probably, yeah, something to learn. I should learn something from that now. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I just, I just, I knew that money wasn't my aim. It was never the important. Um, but I had to obviously financially survive. So I just did everything I could. Everything I had was channeled into it, um, going on expeditions, and. Um, and building my career up in natural history filmmaking. And so over those first few years, I was, I was originally going on expeditions and paying. Then I was, then I was getting my flights and my insurance. Um, or sorry, then I was only paying for my flights and insurance and then they were paying all my other expenses. And then as I got more and more experience, um, I was going for free or I was getting paid. And that was like, the threshold I'd, I'd kind of crossed this threshold it's like oh, I can do this professionally I mean just about I don't know how exactly but if I can you know once I crossed that threshold it was like 
There is a chance of doing this. I knew one thing. There's this calculation in my head that I knew. If I get paid to do big, big adventures, I can do them all the time. If I have to save up money to pay to go on them, I'm going to do them a whole lot less. So it was like, <laughs> you know, that was the the that was the uh, the simple calculation in my head. And then I kept doing adventure filmmaking and 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 wildlife filmmaking, and it I became again I was starting to build up a set of skills there, and I loved both, and I didn't really want to leave either because I really enjoyed doing both things, and I love I love variety, I love challenge. Obviously, I just kept doing both things. And the reason that my advent, uh, sorry, my wildlife career took off was because I'd been to some really unusual places on expeditions. And that really opened the doors because a number of film crews started coming to me saying, oh, have you been here? Have you been there? Can you get us in? You know, can you help us set up the logistics to get in and to get a film crew in and out of safely of, of this place or that place? And so it it really, the two things really married together quite well in the end. And yeah, and I ended up working with all sorts of awesome people. I work with David Attenborough. Um, he is as the legend that you really think he is. He really is that awesome. Um, I worked with also other fantastic people, um, Bear Grylls. I know he's big in America. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think who you'll know. Ray Mears, Chris Ryan, um, lots of awesome people and lots of amazing um field biologists and eco warriors and yeah just work with a, an amazing bunch of people i think working with amazing people really inspires you as well um, so you mentioned david attenborough is a really good really good person like we all think he is w what's a lesson you learned from him anything that you really sticks out to you about and maybe something you, you you left learning from him gosh that's a good question um i think having worked with david attenborough he He's very understated. You don't have to be loud or say, you know, it's not all about look at me. You can just, some, someone's like David Attenborough, he, he just gets on with what he does quite quietly, actually. Um, he's just extraordinarily professional. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> that's a good question. I haven't thought about it. I just enjoyed working with him because he was, he was such a gentle, nice man. And he was so clever and so professional that he, um, you know, he didn't need to um, make a big deal of anything. He just got on with it. I think a lot of life's just about getting on with it, isn't it? It's about showing up and getting on with it, no matter what you do. Um, there's, especially in this social media world that we live in, there's a lot of saying that you're going to do things, or, or there's a lot of. I mean, a lot of social media is showing off as well, isn't it? Maybe we're not even meaning to do it, but it's all about exhibiting ourselves and sometimes actually I don't know for me the best bits of life is just actually getting on with it I mean I love doing adventures when you can turn off the social media I know that it's great when there are all those brilliant adventurers out there sharing their adventure which is, inspires people and I think that is great as well but for for purely personal sense sort of purely uh, selfish reasons it is joyful to turn that off when you're on a lovely remote expedition and just to be, and just to show up in the show up every day, and just do your thing, and I don't know. There's a simplicity and a beauty in that, um, and I think I'm not sure if I maybe I got a little hint of that from working with David Attenborough. He just gets on with it. He shows up and he gets on with it. No fuss. <laughs> I wish you could see me. I, I have the biggest smile on my face just because you're in good company here with that mindset because. Yeah, social media, it's a love-hate relationship a lot of the times. It's so important in today's world, you can't deny that, but it's I think it just pulls us away most of the time of what we really want to do. I'll be I'll be honest, I had a talk with my wife last night It's like, how do we get more done? How do we get more um more of the things we actually want to do done? We were staying up late talking and she t challenged me to stay off social media for you know a few months and see if I could see see if that's what's consuming those little bits of time that I seem to not have anymore. Um, and I said you're pro you're probably right, uh, but yeah, and, and also with the age of people like you said, look at me, look at me, look at me. It is so refreshing to see someone on top rising above that crowd that doesn't have that mindset. It's, for, it's refreshing to say the least. Good. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure people would disagree with me as well. <laughs> I'm terrible at social media. And if I, 
the irony is that I have this new book out coming out and I have a really a message and a that I am really passionate about I see social media as part of my work now and I'll I need to now engage in social media more than I ever have Mm -hmm. in order to get the message I have out about adventure being essential um, essential for our well-being um, and something that we need to make time for in our lives and and yet there's this there's this um, conflict because I think if people got away from self social media a lot more they'd have a lot more adventures. <laughs> so, um, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's one of those conundrums of modern life. But, yeah, do you know what? Another really good way that I found of getting things done, myself and my partner sat down five years ago and we did something called, oh, actually, I'm not sure what it's called, but we just wrote down, instead of talking about what we our plans for the future and the things we want to do, the, th- the, the things we want to prioritise in our time, we actually wrote them down. So we wrote down just a few bullet points under the headings of health, wealth, family, and self, I think. Health, wealth, family, and self. I think it's something like that. And so, um, and just under those four headings, a friend told me about this technique. Under those four headings, we each wrote four, three, four, five things. And we've kept it for five. We've we kept those bits of paper. We've just done it again recently because we look back at them and we were like, that really worked. Just by focusing and tr- trying to get away from some of the noise and the clutter and just writing it down. There's an act of, of commitment by writing it onto the paper, I think. And we put things like move to a place in the wilderness near water and trees. That's what, that was on our that was on our list or my list. And then we compared our list. Um, having a child was on the list, so we achieved that one as well. Um, and also just things like learning to kayak. I really want to learn to kayak because I'm not a kayaker. Yeah, we've actually we haven't done everything on our list, but 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 it really helped it happen because um, there's not time to do everything. It's it's there's so many awesome things to do. How can you fit them all in? You've got to uh, start saying no to things so that you can make time for the other things. <laughs> I'm going off the point probably. Well, 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 tell us about. It. I know we could sit here and talk all day about your stories and what you've done, but I, but I know your your big passion is getting other people out there, and I'd say that's the whole point of this show too, is just to get people to actually get out the door and do something. Um, tell us about the book Adventure Revolution. When did you decide I need to write a book about this idea um, and inspire people to get out there and do something? It started, I think, when it st- worked for me. So when I first realized that adventure had really helped me, I just started to get curious about like, why? You know, why have I, why do I talk about adventure as my therapy? Like, why do I use that word? Why do I think of it as something that saved me? Um, and I, I think, and I, why do I also feel that if I hadn't found adventure, that I just wouldn't be as happy as I, you know, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't feel like I'd have, been um as as you know not that I'm uh, sorry I can't think of the word <laughs> flourishing sort of thing I, d- I just don't think that my life would have would have been so I wouldn't have thrived as much if I hadn't found adventure so it all started with you know why has adventure helped me and my curiosity around finding out that out or finding out why but, uh, in my 20s as I was saying earlier a lot of my my focus was about finding my next hit. It's like, I, I need to feel alive. I need to go on adventures. And so I kept doing all these adventures. No matter how I could find the money, I would just find big adventures, big, mostly expeditions. You know, I needed to go on expeditions. And then in my 30s, I started, or, or in my late 20s, I started to recognize that actually this was working for other people as well. So it helped me, it helped me grow it helped me thrive, but I could see that it was helping other people as well to to be the best that they could be, to find their best lives, you know, to to live their best lives, to to find happiness. I mean, as it sounds cheesy, but you know, just to to find that holy grail, grail that we're all looking for. And so when I realised that it, you know, it's not just me that adventure works on this power that adventure has, I I became more and more interested in finding out how. 
and I I read a lot. I looked. I was looking for the. I was looking for a book to explain why does adventure help us? Why is it essential for our well being? And I couldn't find it. And so, I suppose I started writing it at that point, or at least I started re- researching the book at that point, because I. And then now I I've, I've written the book that I wish I could have read twenty years ago, <laughs> and it would have helped me a lot. I think in figuring out. In, in, if nothing else, is in just prioritizing adventure in my life. Um, it would have made me um, not um, not feel like you know that pressure you get when you're when you when parents, family, even friends are like, when are you going to get a real job? When are you going to grow up? It's like actually, this isn't about not growing up or not getting a real job. It's actually about living. Um, and I, I'm not saying that you have to do adventure as your career either. Um, um, but it, but but it is really essential to have adventure in your everyday life and in in your life. Um, so sorry, this is a really long winded answer. Um, <laughs> it started with me realizing that adventure had worked for me and it had been my therapy. Then after years of taking people on expeditions, I realized that it helps other people and there was something that needed to be discovered. And I wanted to share that message. Once I'd finally dug around and I wanted to share that message. A really big turning point came for me um, about 19 years ago. I was stood outside the Royal Geographical Society in the rain, and I'd just come back from the Amazon, and um, I had all these young people that I'd taken out. I was only 26 years old my, my, myself, but I was the youngest chief leader they'd ever had at the British Exploring Society. And we were all back six months after the Amazon expedition. We were all back in England to present the expedition and I was stood in this queue with all these young people I hadn't seen for six months and it was so great to see all their faces and you know catching up and this woman came up to me and she said what have you done to my daughter and I just thought oh no what (laughs) what is this I was like is this the girl that got bitten by a bat is this (laughs) the girl that got is it one of the many um, you know, one of the many poor young people who got like um, various jungle parasites, and I was just there thinking, "Oh no, what? I'm in trouble here." You know, what? What's she going to lay on me now? And she instead she came up and she just hugged me, this huge bear hug, and she said, "She she just said she's just so she's just so changed." And then she said that her daughter was called Alice, and then it all made sense. And Alice had been. Um, a young person on the expedition who had been one of my biggest challenges. She had, she had found it hard to fit in. She had a lot of ongoing, she had a lot of problems in her past, a lot of problems at home, a lot of things she was struggling with. You know, she, she was basically a teenager who was struggling a bit like I was a teenager struggling a good, I don't know, what was that? 10 years earlier or whatever. And so I saw something of myself in her anyway. Alice really, really struggled at the start of the expedition. But I, I kept supporting her, kept, but also gave her challenges, gave her some jobs to do. And it, it really helped to empower her on the expedition. And from the, the start of the expedition to the end of the expedition, she had completely transformed. But And I'd seen that before, and I'd experienced it to some degree myself. So I kind of recognized it, but I didn't know if it was going to last. But the, here I was, stood six months later in the rain in England, <laughs> I was saying earlier, it doesn't rain in England. Oh, it caught me out. Anyway, here I was stood in London and this, her, her mother was saying to me, you know, now she helps at home. She's got, she's doing much better at school. And, you know, the most importantly, probably that she has some new friends. She, she started to really build a friendship group, which she'd had struggles with in the past. And it was just, it was just such a magical thing to hear. And of all the memories of that expedition it was an amazing expedition in the amazon it just hit me there was something really important about that moment and i can remember it with such clarity even today and i just thought no this is this is something i've been seeing but it's something that i'm not recognizing or or not it's something i'm recognizing but it's something i'm not flagging up it's like this keeps happening you know when i run youth development expeditions the whole point is the youth come back different. You know? mm-hmm. And so did I off my first expedition. And over the years, that was the sort of turning point for me. But but that was um, over the years, I've seen many, many, many people go on expeditions or even small adventures. So, you know, I talk about big adventures a lot, but 
Um, the book is all about also about going on small adventures and people changing through going on small adventures and just finding those first steps as well as the big stuff. Um, but this incredible transformation that happens when people challenge themselves, um, take themselves out of their ordinary worlds, go into another world. It doesn't have to be abroad, but go somewhere away from all the usual pressures and expectations and noise. And you go, it could just be to a national park in your own country. You don't have to go overseas, but you challenge yourself. You walk across something or you summit something or you kayak down something and you do something you've never done before. You can have help. You can have guides. You can have you know, um, people there to support you, but you achieve something um, very, very special through going on adventures. Um, and I could go on for, for but the book goes on for 200 pages about all the different details of, of all the different ways that adventure can help you. But for me, that was a big turning point. And that's where I started to think I really need to research this a bit more. Um, and so I don't know. In some ways, I started the book 19 years ago <laughs> on that rainy day. But also, but probably I was a bit of a procrastinator. I was too busy having fun on adventures. <laughs> right. So um, I, I did a bit of research. Yeah. <laughs> I did a bit of research and then the research just built up and built up, but I never wrote anything. Um, and then I did a lot more research about six years ago when I thought, no, this is the time. And I did a lot of interviews with people I'd been on expeditions with, some of which I'd been on expeditions with, you know, 20 years before or 10 years before. So I could really see if there was a longevity to this. And then I read masses of biology, uh, sorry, masses of scientific research. Um, and I, I kind of tried to distill like what is what I call the adventure effect. And, and so I've tried to explain what I think the adventure effect is in the book, and, you know, how adventure um, affects us in a really positive way. It helps us to heal, helps us to grow. It helps us to build really good relationships. It helps us to, um, what did I say, grow? Yeah, to grow and stretch, you know, to find out what we can do. It helps us to find meaning. I think um, definitely for me, I found meaning in life through adventures and, and what it's taught me um it, it helps you to face fear and to learn how to face fear there's all these wonderful things actually but it all started on that rainy day in london about the book what what is it that people will walk away with and what can they expect when reading the book are, are they hearing stories from you is it it's interviews i know you talked about all that what can they expect reading the book and, and where will they be able to find it because i know it doesn't come out until uh, august yeah so the book um, is basically a mixture of stories of transformation, people going on adventures, you know, wonderful adventure stories, but then these transformations that happen and they're big adventures as well as small adventures. So it could just be some set of surfing lessons that change this little boy's called Sam's life, which if you have time, I'll tell you his story. It's amazing. But um, so the book is a mixture of adventure stories and it's distilled popular science. So I spent, I've spent years learning about sort of self-teaching myself, um, popular, uh, sorry, positive psychology, even a bit of evolutionary psychology and loads of, loads and loads of stuff. But that sounds really dry. I've distilled the science down into really, um, into sort of these sort of, hopefully these really um, easy to take little nuggets that are sort of sewn into the adventure stories. And so what I hope people will do is either the people who go on adventures and who know that there's something that is really nourishing them from doing adventures, I hope that they'll read the book and they'll go, yes, I, this is why I do need to spend more time doing adventures. I shouldn't, I shouldn't think, oh, I haven't got time for it. It's not important enough. Um, you know, it's, it, it is fun, but it's also good for you. Um, and I think um, I think we can write off adventure too much, can't we? We think that it's frivolous and not, that it, you know, we've got more important things to do. Well, actually, it is really important. So you've got to fit it into your life. So my the thing that I'd really love to do is for people to read the book and then go off and do an adventure that they wouldn't have otherwise done. I mean, that would be my perfect scenario. And even better for them to take someone else who wouldn't normally do adventurous stuff and help them to go and do something that they wouldn't have otherwise done. But, um, I mean, the book also talks a bit at the end about uh, not just how we can personally live more adventurously, um, which is what I hope, um, I hope the book will you know, really um, sort of push home to you, you know, that, that, we, that it's really good for you. 
but also how our societies can be set up to be more adventurous how, through urban planning, through um, something uh, like social prescribing. You know, when, when people are depressed or anxious, you know, there are things that, there is such a thing as adventure therapy. Uh, and that is something that we should be using a lot more. Um, yeah, I don't know. Oh, and you asked about where you could get it. So it is available. Um, I know it's available on Amazon. Um, I I know that it's available all over the place in in England and America, in uh, England and New Zealand and Australia. And at the moment, I'm not sure how it's coming out in America, but I definitely know that it's the audio book will be and the Kindle will be available in America on the 5th of August. And I'm sure shortly after that, hopefully it will be um, very available. You can always email me if you want a copy. You can at Belinda at Explorers Connect. And uh, sorry, that's a, I think you can get it on Amazon. <laughs> Belinda, I, I don't feel like we really were able to get into your story that much. Um, but there, is there anything else you'd like to share as we wrap up? Um, I can't think of anything else. Yeah, um, buy my book. And uh, buy two, give one to your friends. Or if you enjoy the book, give it to your, give yours, you know. There's nothing better than a book you love and passing it on. If you don't want to read the book, just go and have an adventure. That's also a book. <laughs> That's perfect as well. <laughs> that, that will accomplish the same message from the book. So, well, Belinda, we're going to have to have you back on to t- tell some more stories. Here's some, like, specific stories uh, and learn a little bit more from you of what you've learned over the years. But I, I do want to say thank you for joining uh, the Adventure Sports Podcast, and, and we'd love to have you back on. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been really fun chatting tonight. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun. Annie had an earache on a Saturday of all days. So her mom brought her to Minute Clinic at CVS, where you can see a provider, fill a prescription, and grab essentials like pain relief products, all in one visit. Even on evenings and weekends, you can even see us online with telehealth options. For quality, affordable care on your schedule, visit Minute Clinic at CVS. That's healthier made easier. Services vary by location. See MinuteClinic.com for details. We can sum up McDonald's new crispy chicken sandwich in one word. Crispy. But also juicy and tender. Maybe crispy, juicy, tender. All one word? Okay, fine. You'll just have to try our crispy chicken sandwich to understand it. Get a free medium fries and medium soft drink with purchase of any crispy chicken sandwich. Available only on the app. Price of participation may vary. McDonald's app download and registration required.